the first Europeans to cross the Pacific and see the wonders of that sea spent maybe a few days marveling at the crazy species of fish they never saw and the obviously different waters that they uh, were used to and an additional 3 months and 20 days of nothing. No rand, no natives, no nothing save for two empty islands. Instead, the crew crossed the calm sea. It was, in fact, named the Pacific Ocean because they were never hit by storms or rough uh, waters. And they watched as their bread rotted into maggot-covered shells with rat piss, giving it a nauseating smell. And when they ran out of that, they ate the leather covering their ship's masts. And when they ran out of that, they began cooking and eating rats. Worst of all, the disease most associated with pirates and old-timey sailors reared its ugly head. Scurvy, the source of many jokes between pirate nuts online, but not the sailors at this time. It was so severe that it prevented uh, several crew members from eating at all, and in the end, 19 men died from scurvy, including the Patagonian that they had on board, who before died allegedly asked to be baptized, and he perished with the Spanish name Pablo. Pigafit even remarks that he believes no one would dare to make such a crossing after them, and uh, if there had been storms or rough uh, weather along the way, they would have surely starved to death in the open ocean. Now, like I said, three whole months of pure fucking nothing, where all you see are your stinky ass crew members, the sea and the sky, until the expedition reached an island, a big one in several other islands close by, they reached an archipelago and immediately got into conflict with the Chamorro people. Uh, so upon doing some mild investigation, it seems that he arrived at the Mariana uh, Islands. These are islands that he, he called the Islands of Thieves, as apparently when they invited the natives on board the ships, they got robbed, and the captains in retaliation took 40 people and burned an equal amount of native homes. This was in uh, uh, March, and on the 16th of that month, they finally found an island that and they could stop at and rest. One called Samar. Yes, they reached the fucking Philippines. You probably can't see this, take a screenshot and zoom in and you'll see my absolute glorious artwork. Uh, and there, they built a big tin for the six sailors among them and began foraging around the island for food and supplies. And around two days later, some natives showed up on boats, nine of them in total. And unlike the previous natives that they did not have a good time with, these ones were far friendlier. Magellan had these ones fed and in return, they were given fishes and some other fruits, in indicating uh, as well that in four days time, they would be back with some rice to offer. They spent quite a bit of time with uh, these natives, and over time, they learned quite a bit about each other. For example, the island that they were uh, from was actually called Zoroan, and when it was time to leave, Magellan ordered the salvo to be uh, fired off, you know, as a prank, because natives were funny like that. And after calming them down, the two parties left off amicably, and the natives promised to return with more gifts. It genuinely seemed at this time like things were working up uh, for a good old Magellan. He'd found the steady sorts of goods in the islands and also friendly natives. In the meantime, they gave uh, the archipelago they were on its first, albeit temporary, western uh, name, that of Saint Lazarus. Several days went by with uh, the crew resting and the return of the natives bringing canoes filled with oranges and other goods which Magellan bought from them. During this time, Pigafetta remarks on their appearance. The inhabitants had such large holes in their ears, and their ears were so drooped that one could pass an arm through them. These people are considered savages, that is. They are heathens. They walk around naked, covering only their genitalia with a piece of tree bark, and some readers with a piece of cotton fabric, embroidered with silk at both ends. They have a olive complexion, 
and are generally quite obese, painting and greasing their whole bodies with coconut and sesame oil to protect themselves from the sun and wind. They have black hair that is so long it reaches their waists, and their weapons include knives, shields, maces, and spears. On the 25th of March, a pig a fitted, a dumb piece of uh, shit, nearly kills himself. Anyways, on the same day, they departed from Samar, making course generally to the southwest, crossing through four islands in the quote unquote Lazarus uh, archipelago, and on the 28th, they were met by a small craft, which they learned was called a Boloto, crewed by eight men, some of them slaves. This encounter was different. Uh, a Boloto, as far as I'm aware, is a more advanced version of a canoe with floats on either side to keep it stable. This encounter was weird for the expedition, as they refused to talk to the uh, commander or climb aboard. After a bit, the natives simply fucked off and came back with two barangays, which are twice the size of the advanced canoes, with the Roko uh, King in the largest of the two vessels. Encounters went amicably, actually. They shared some gifts, the expedition got invited to dinner with the Roko King, and after some uh, assurances that these strangers that sailed in from the Far East were here for friendships and not hostilities, they literally hugged it out and got baskets of rice as gifts from the king. It seems like the monarch's suspicions had been ill-placed. The Europeans uh, bragged about their fancy tech, showing their cool armor, the cannons that scared the unwalking natives, and Magellan spilled the beans on how they came here and the unending months they spent without seeing any land. And Pigafetta was sent along with one other uh, man to I guess tell more stories about Spain and Europe to this king. The duo would spend the night with this monarch, undergoing what was potentially a welcoming ceremony, where Pigafetta remarks that it looked like the king was about to slap him. His partner, however, got drunk, and in the following morning, the duo were uh, brought back to their uh, ship, accompanied by the king's brother, who lived in a different island, an island with uh, the kingdoms of Butuan and Karagan, whose rulers are respectively Nkorambu and Siagu. In the last day of March, Magellan took the uh, ships to this land to have a more general meeting with uh, the, uh, the brother kings, and from what I understood, to formalize an alliance treaty. He gave them a large uh, cross to install on the island, so that whenever future expeditions sailed through, they'd know that uh, whoever lived here was friendly. They talked about religion, and the brothers confessing to worship a vague uh, deity in the sky that they called Abba, which made the Spaniards jizz their pants as they uh, do. And they, uh, plant, and they planted that cross in the following morning. And after a pretty significant and positive meeting between these two groups, Magellan departed and made way for the port of Cebu. Magellan even made a little switcheroo here, leaving behind a hostage in exchange for pirates that didn't take them to Cebu. And what they found in the week that they spent there was oodles of gold. They arrived on the 7th of April and they saw dozens of villages and with uh, houses built on treetops. They sh uh, shot another salvo of their cannons upon arrival because, you know, it, it's fun. It's fun to prank uh, natives. And Magellan sent an officer and an interpreter to shore to meet with uh, the local king, who was uh, Raja Umabon, and explained that the uh, salvo was just a uh, tradition upon arriving to these lands. And after explaining their intentions to the king, they then uh, he, the king, told them that in order to dock, they had to pay a tax, bringing up the fact that this tax had been paid by dozens of Moorish uh, traders, including several from modern-day Taiwan, Taiwan, then Siam. This officer flatly fucking refused, saying something akin to, we serve the most powerful king in the world, and he will not pay taxes to lesser kings. And if the king of Cebu wanted peace, he'd have it, but he could just as well have war. 
Okay, yeah, sure. Go ahead and escalate the situation, my dude. But this power play, puzzlingly, seems to have worked. The king of Cebu, threatened by what he heard from the Moorish traders confusing the Spanish for Portuguese, and later uh, uh, clarifying by the Spanish that they were stronger, not only didn't ask for a tax, but offered to become a tributary to the Spanish emperor. Now that's a threatened monarch if I've ever seen one. Instead, all they asked of him was exclusive trade with him in his island. And so it was. Magellan and Humabon made an alliance, calling upon most of the island's chiefs to see the signing, with Magellan and the king sitting on red furred chairs and the chiefs uh, sitting on leather covered chairs. And while at this ceremony, the pair got to talking. Umabon, explaining the customs of his people, which, to oversimplify, left Magellan angry and ranting about God and Spanish customs, which actually got the king and the attending chiefs excited. <laughs> Basically, the custom in, in question is youngsters not respecting their elders, while in Spain, they do. This, amongst other things that he said about the Catholic faith, seemed to have convinced the king of uh, Cebu his wife, and 2,000 uh, other natives to convert. So they all hugged it out as they declared eternal friendship, and two days later they had a little bit of gift exchanging, and the king of uh, Cebu decided that his baptism would take place on the 14th of April, 1521. In the day of the ceremony, there were 40 armored uh, Spaniards in the square, while the king and Magellan talked. According to Pigafetta, Ferdinand had tried to further sweeten the deal by promising that he would become the most powerful monarch in all the islands, and that all would cower before him. The king said in return that it didn't really matter, he'd be converting to uh, Christianity no matter what. I have a theory on this, a game theory. Umabon was faking all of this. Just imagine this, a fucking super soldier whom you touch you die with all this fancy, overpowered and unbalanced weaponry he shows up, acting like king and shit, are you going to try and put him in his place, or get on his good side before someone else does? I'm not going to get super deep into it, because again, this video is about the expedition, though how exactly the expedition handled natives in the Philippines is a great story. I won't talk about it, do it yourself, queers. But the Philippines, though, though underdeveloped and not super rich, had progressed enough that kingdoms were a thing. These aren't the tribes of uh, North America, but they neither are the Aztec Empire in Mexico. They're a weird mix, where kings exist, but chiefs and tribes do as well. So it stands to reason, politics exists as well. So you are a king with unruly chiefs in rival kingdoms. Are you going to make friends with uh, the super soldier and hope he shares some of his awesome guns? Or are you going to tell him to fuck off and get yourself killed? Or you know, risk him going to your rivals? So the king took the name of Charles and his wife the name Joanna. Nearly the entire island and neighboring islands got baptized, save for a village which refused, and the merciful Catholics in their great wisdom burned it down. Regardless of my theory or not, either through coercion, the super soldier aspect I mentioned, or genuine belief, Majon's influence grew on the king of Cebu as he got Charles to swear an oath of fealty to the king before the cross uh, in the church that they had built up. Pigafetta remarks on uh, the islanders' pagan rituals, which I'll ignore because that's gay as hell. On the 26th of April, Magellan got word of an iron that was not giving him tribute. Well, not all of it. This was due to a chief on the island that was denying service to Magellan, and therefore not cooperating. This was Chief Rapu Rapu. Magellan, of course, decides to take matters into his own hands, setting off on three smaller boats and with uh, 60 armored men with him. And what happens here is important, as what will happen is the first battle against Spaniards 
won by a Filipino. And again, uh, it was three boats in the round 20 to 30 barangays. I know I'm mispronouncing that. With the uh, Cebu king, Humabon, or Charles, accompanying them. They arrived around three hours before dawn. And Magellan gave the natives on the island one last chance. Get in line, pay your tribute, or die. And the Spaniards were hopelessly outmatched. Pigafetta remarks that when they got the, uh, his demand, the natives simply asked, Hey, don't attack us at night, please. We got reinforcements coming and we'll fight better at dawn. And the Europeans waited until dawn. And while 11 men stayed with the boats, 49 went to shore to fight 500 native islanders. Their boats weren't the river killing boats like they hoped, but it would just make them angrier. Magellan was with uh, the Spanish uh, force, and he was easily identifiable as a leader. The natives singled him out from the rest, and uh, after separating him, one after another went after him. And here, at the Battle of Mactan, around an hour after combat uh, began, Magellan was killed. The native allied king was even told by Magellan to stay on the ships, and apparently, according to Pigafetta, he wept when he heard of Magellan's death. Pigafetta's words, not mine. The rest of the Spanish troops got back on their boats and fled back to the fleet. And like that, the leader of the expedition is dead. The man who wanted this expedition most of all, fought for a few years to have it, died due to simple mistakes in the needle. Magellan's story from the beginning was one of triumph. He successfully petitioned the Spanish king for an expedition. He had numerous and successful encounters with natives along the South American coast. He successfully crossed into the Pacific and uh, he also crossed the Pacific Ocean, a feat no one had dared to do and which nearly killed the expedition. Then to arrive in the Philippines and everyone seemingly falling in love with him in, uh, in Spain, all of that must have created a massive ego for him. And well, life does that thing it always does. What he did was great, and what he did must have made him think he was the biggest motherfucker in the world before he got humbled permanently by naked scary men. And oh, our story isn't over, fuck no. The expedition was shaken by this. Magellan's personal slave, Enrique, refused to do any work and stayed aboard the ships. And Rapu Rapu, uh, when asked her, uh, uh, to return Magellan, refused literally saying that's a damn fine trophy and I'm keeping it and the crew would erect Duarte Barbosa, a Portuguese and the Spaniard by the name of Juan Serrano to the position of commander of the expedition. Duarte didn't like seeing some petulant slaves sitting around on his ass so he threatened the man to get back to work or get whipped and apparently according to Pigafetta uh, the slave got up and went to plot with uh, the king of Cebu. That's what he says, but I reckon the king had this plan already. And you know, going back to the super soldier theory. On the 1st of May, the king of Umabon tells the new commanders he has a shipment of precious stones to give to the Spanish king. And before handing it off to the crew, he'd like to have a feast with everyone. 30 Spaniards went including the astrologer San Martin of Seville and both commanders of the expedition. Pigafetta didn't go as he was recovering from a poisoned arrow he got during the Battle of Mactan. Some suspicions why, why is that word failing me? Fuck me. were already mounting however, as a miraculously cured native had led their chaplain into his house, where screams were later heard coming from. But Towards the end of the feast, armed uh, uh, Cebuano warriors came in and killed everyone, with just three surviving this massacre. Believing Cebu to have turned, the crew on the uh, boats hoisted anchors and fired on the town. It was at in this time that they saw one of their commanders, uh, Juan Serrano, tied up, injured, 
and being led through the town as a prisoner towards the beach, where he asked the crew to stop firing or he'd be killed. After asking what happened uh, to the other 23 men who went to the feast, uh, Juan said that they were all murdered. And again, if they wouldn't stop firing, he would become one of the casualties. The crew left him. With a man named João Carvalho, uh, f apparently a friend of Serrano himself, giving the order uh, to leave. Their new old commander is to be presumed dead. And with that, the crew leaves the Philippines and continues along their journey, reeling from the failure and the May 1st massacre.